thank you very much, very much Federico, and uh, thank you very much to the committee for uh, giving me the opportunity to show you uh, our work on uh, heart regeneration progresses. So th this is a cartoon that I took from the, the uh, Netter Atlas uh, that was very popular in the 80s and 90s when uh, I, I studied medicine. It shows a patient uh, with uh, uh, myocardial infarction. He has pain in his chest, it's very cold outside. He just went out to a restaurant, probably had a, a very big meal. It's cold outside, it's snow, and uh, the, there is a, uh, an occlusion in one of his coronary arteries that determines the death of the portion of the heart uh, uh, that uh, is uh, uh, irritated by that artery, and then this uh, portion of dead heart increases, and the only way of repairing, if the patient doesn't die because of an arrhythmia, is uh, to transform the lost tissue into uh, a, a scar. If the patient is lucky and he lives uh, in, a, in a very close to an hospital, he can be brought uh, to the in an interventional cardiology unit. An interventional cardiology performs an angioplasty, the portion of the heart that is uh, uh, has been lost, uh, is significantly reduced. There is still some increase in uh, uh, death uh, of cardiomyocytes due to reperfusion, and eventually the scar uh, becomes uh, smaller. This is a major cause of disease and death in the world. One, one uh, person out of three in the world, 30% of humanity, including low and middle income countries, die because of cardiovascular disorders, and in 80% of cases, this is uh, somehow related to these kind of conditions. So basically what we want is to have a new drug that uh, protects the heart during this process and uh, if we're very optimistic, a drug that can be injected at this moment to regenerate the lost portion of the heart. Speaking about regenerating the heart uh, is, is, is a very non-trivial problem. About two, from two to four billion cardiomyocytes are lost after a typical myocardial infarction from the left ventricle. And people have tried over the last uh, 15 years uh, to uh, find ways uh, to replace this lost myocardium. All the experiments started around the early 2000s with the idea that uh, bone marrow could contain stem cells uh, that would regenerate the heart in the form of uh, 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 CD34 or, or CKID positive stem cells or mesenchyma stem cells. This, uh, turn out to be a failure, cardiosphere don't regenerate, adult stem cells, if they exist, they don't regenerate, cardiac progenitor cells, perhaps they might exist, but they're not being exploited. Obviously, you can obtain cardiomyocytes from embryonic stem cells or IPS cells, but this is a stoichiometric process, so you have to obtain one billion cardiomyocytes from one billion embryonic stem cells in the laboratory and then inject these cells in, in vivo. Very tricky problem for a disease that uh, affects uh, one-third of uh, the humanity. You can obtain uh, cardiomyocytes uh, from uh, fibroblasts, but this is very elegant in vitro through transcription factors, but again, this is very stoichiometric and uh, you lack the vectors that have the capacity to transduce the three, four factors simultaneously into one billion fibroblasts in vivo to achieve a result. The problem is that uh, the, the field has been hampered by the uh, idea that uh, cardiac regeneration should uh, be performed through exogenous cells because of the lack of endogenous uh, capacity of regeneration of the heart. There, is, uh, there has been a dogma until a couple of a few years ago uh, in, in the cardiology field that cardiomyocytes uh, in the adulthood don't replicate. And certainly this is true. Cardiomyocardial myocardial infarction is repaired through a scarring mechanism if you do uh, uh, um, C14 dating of the age of cardiomyocytes, it turns out that a person of 72 years of age has more than 50% of his or her cells form at the moment of birth. So I think this is also a fantastic notion that we have most of the cells in our heart are exactly those with which we were born and have kept beating for billions of times during our life. However, there is evidence uh, that uh, if you measure the capacity of cardiomyocytes to proliferate, it is not zero. It is 1% per year, so too small to have a, a, a benefit. And, and also, if you look at uh, cardiomyocyte division in the infarct border zone, sometimes you see some uh, cardiomyocytes that undergo mitosis. If you want to see the, the glass uh, empty uh, full, then this would imply that there is a biological mechanism for endogenous repair. However, this is not use, used at the clinical level, but there might be the possibility of boosting it for therapeutic purposes. And obviously there are other species like zebrafish that do regenerate the heart and they do that by 
uh, having the cardiomyces, pre-existing cardiomyces replicating. So the idea is, uh, can we boost this mechanism for therapeutic uh, purposes? And cardiomyces replication is known to be basically under the control of two main uh, mainstream activators, those that act externally growth factors, cytokines, and other mediators, soluble mediators, and those that act intracellularly. And those that act uh, from the outside are very poorly uh, uh, known. Uh, uh, if you uh, search the literature for factors that are known to work on stem cell progenitors uh, and differentiation of them toward cardiomyces, you find a myriad of, of several factors. There are several factors also working in neonatal cardiomyces, but many less uh, on the heart or an adult cardiomyces. So basically, there is only one factor that being um, uh, described, you wriggling one to work in all kinds of conditions. We know a bit more about the intracellular regulator of cardiomyocyte proliferation because uh, there have been studies uh, over the years of many cell cycle regulators, uh, also in other cell types, uh, that also work to drive cardiomyocyte proliferation. And uh, uh, we are an AV uh, laboratory. We have been trying over the last 10 years uh, many, many of these regulators. Uh, this is just an incomplete list uh, to see if they can boost uh, uh, cardiac repair. And all of these factors have been tested after myocardial infarction and all these are ineffective. Other laboratories have tested other factors which are listed here. They are also very ineffective, or if they boost cardiomyocyte proliferation, they boost indeed uh, S-phase uh, DNA synthesis, and then everything ends up in a mitotic catastrophe because the cells cannot uh, uh, go beyond G2M. What changes drastically between a replicating cardiomyocytes and a non-replicating cardiomyocytes, for example, a replicating cardiomyocytes immediately at birth in a window of seven days in the mouse when replication still occurs and in adulthood when replication does not occur, are also the levels of several microRNAs. This is a, uh, just a heat map showing several microRNAs that are active, very highly expressed in neonates, and then they go down in adulthood and several other microRNAs that are low in neonates and they go up in adulthood. So a few years ago we started a project uh, by asking ourselves whether there are microRNAs that could trigger cardiomyocyte proliferation. So uh, we have a, a screening platform in Trieste and so uh, at that moment we tested almost 1,000 uh, different uh, human microRNAs for the induction of proliferation. The screening was uh, high content uh, and uh, at the end of the story we found approximately 40 microRNAs of human origin that boost proliferation uh, of uh, neonatal uh, rat cardiomyocyte, mouse cardiomyocyte, and then we shortlisted them. And we have now eight mic microRNAs that are very active also in human uh, embryonic stem cells, the right cardiomyocytes, and also fetal cardiomyocytes from abortion fetuses. When I say proliferation, it means that the screening was EDU incorporation, so S phase synthesis, DNA synthesis. Uh, however, these cardiomyces are very active also in driving G2M. This is a fossil histone H3 staining of cardiomyces after the treatment with one of the proliferative microRNAs. And this is Aurora B t um, localization in mid bodies, which is a typical localization of Aurora B during uh, um, cell division karyokinesis. So there is really proliferation of cells, which is also seen here. This is one of the most active microRNAs, 1825. You see, this is a plate on your natal cardiomyces after six days in culture, they have stopped dividing. If you give the microRNA, basically they fill up the place. So there is a real cell division. For us, it was very obvious to uh, test the effect of AV vectors expressing the genes of these microRNAs. So Lorena constructed AV9, and uh, we injected them first in neonates, and uh, after 12 days, the hearts were really very, very big. Uh, they became big not because the, the cardiomyces are hypertrophic, the size of cardiomyces is more or less the same as normal, even a bit uh, smaller, but they are hyperplastic, so there are many more cells into these hearts. And to make the long story short, basically if you give this AV vector immediately after myocardial infarction, you see regeneration of the heart. These are cardiac parameters, uh, ejection fraction goes down, this is uh, after in the controls, in white, this is heart failure in mice. If you give the microRNA, it remains as, as uh, normal labels. Oh, sorry, if you look at, uh, wow. Okay, if you look at scar size, this is a, this is a big scar and after two months from infarction in a control animals, scars are much smaller in the animals treated with the, the microRNAs. This obviously opened a lot of questions that uh, in, in, over this period we have tried to answer. First, which are the target cells on which the microRNA work? 
So we did a fate mapping experiment in which we crossed the mouse, which have a myosin heavy chain promoter driving at atmosphere industry in Rubel Cree with a flux mouse in which GFP is uh, uh, switched off until recombination occurs. We gave tamoxifen for seven days, so these are other animals, 85% uh, of the cardiomyces turn green. And so we labeled this cardiomyces with green, and then uh, we did myocardial infarction, injecting the AV expressing 590 or 199A, which are two of the most effective microRNAs, asking the question whether the cells that start incorporating bromine sociuridine, so they uh, enter the cycle, are either black or green. If they are black, they come from elsewhere. If they are green, that was the pre-existing cardiomyces that started replicating. All the cells that incorporated BRDU, as you can see here, were green. So it means that these microRNAs push pre-existing cardiomyces to enter the cell cycle and uh, to synthesize DNA. So you see this beautiful cardiomyces that were pre-existing the uh, in microRNA delivery that uh, starts incorporating uh, uh, DNA. We became more audacious, and so we uh, recovered the adult cardiomyces with a standard Langendorf procedure, and we put this as in culture. Uh, in the presence of serum, they become a bit more round. If you, at that point, if you give them microRNA, they start dividing. You see these big monstrous cells that enter the uh, cell cycle, start incorporating BRDU. They also start, uh, the enter the cell cycle, as is shown here by positivity to a KI67, which is a cell, uh, broad cell cycle uh, marker. You see these big cells that uh, enter the cell cycle. And they also divide their uh, nuclei. This is incorporation of phosphon histone H3. You see also staining of uh, chromosomal plates here. So big cells that start uh, uh, dividing. So these microRNAs enter pre-existing cardiomyces. We don't know if all cardiomyces, or this is a subset of cardiomyces which are prone to replication. We don't know if they are binucleated or mononucleated, but still there is a subset of cardiomyces that respond to this microRNA through uh, proliferation. This is by, by, by far not very different from what happens in zebrafish. Uh, zebrafish completely regenerates heart in about uh, 40 days, and the regeneration occurs because the pre-existing cardiomyces start proliferating, and they stop proliferating only when replication has uh, uh, finished. What is the mechanism by which this microRNA uh, work? Uh, we took uh, the uh, uh, most effective microRNAs, which are listed here, 199 um, uh, A3P, 519, 1825. These two members, which are a class of microRNAs that are very expressed in embryonic stem cells, 302D and 373. Uh, 33B for which star, which for which was very little literature, and then uh, two microRNA, 106 and 93, which are part of a cluster which has been shown to be pro-hypertrophic, but the way we find that they increase also proliferation, uh, transfected cardiomyocytes, and did uh, RNA-seq uh, to search uh, for common signatures. We found in uh, by gene ontology what we would expect that these. Uh, uh, microRNAs increase uh, genes involved in the cell cycle, DNA replication, uh, and so on, and then they decrease uh, metabolic pathway, oxidative phosphorylation. There is a switch when there is proliferation between oxidative phosphorylation and, uh, and the lipid, by, by lipid uh, uh, oxidation. So this is more or less expected. Uh, we, we, we search the, if these microRNAs are related in their signature on the heat maps. And what we found is that what is also what was more or less expected that 93 and 106B, which belong to the same cluster, they also cluster together in, uh, in terms of uh, efficacy. And the two embryonic stem cells, microRNA, 302D, and 373, they also cluster together. The other were more or less uh, uh, unrelated. What was more interesting is then in, in, is uh, when we uh, started to see if there are common pathways that by informatics were targeted by these microRNAs. And by informatic analysis, it turned out to reveal that these are the four pathways that are very much uh, interested. So there are proteins in the uh, HIPO pathway which are down-regulated. So down-regulated uh, factors are those, uh, mRNA are those that are either direct or indirect targets of uh, the microRNA like LATS1 and LATS2. And these uh, transcription factors here, TIA2, TIA1, which are very common to several, several of the microRNAs. Now, you, you might remember that the HIPPO pathway is very popular in these days because there have been a lot of studies to show how it signals mechanotransduction for the proliferation, especially of cancer cells. The key effector of the pathway is a transcriptional cofactor, which is called YAP or 
and uh, there is a sister who is TARS, but is not expressing the heart, so in the heart there is only YAP. And this binds to a transcription factor, which is TIAD, TIAD1 or TIAD2, and derives expression of a series of genes that uh, promote proliferation. YAP, however, in non-proliferating cells is kept in the cytoplasm through phosphorylation, and then it is degraded. And phosphorylation occurs through a cascade of signals that is carried out by uh, several kinases. The most absent kinase is called LATS1 and 2, and then there is another kinase, which is MST1, 2, which is uh, the mammalian homolog or HIPO, hence the pathway. So these two kinases have an inhibitory uh, uh, effect. Consuelo took uh, the promoter uh, that responds to the TIA transcription factor, uh, cloned it uh, upstream uh, of the firefly luciferase gene, and transfected this into cardiomyocytes, and it asked the question whether uh, microRNA treatment of these uh, uh, um, cardiomyocytes would trigger expression of luciferase, showing that uh, there is a YAP activation. She found that uh, 10 out of 10 of the proproliferative microRNAs activated YAP. And 10 out of 10 of the microRNAs also in, uh, induce localization of YAP in the nucleus. You see, for example, in the first lane, is the amount of YAP that normally in the nucleus, if you give the microRNA 199A, there is this amount in the nucleus. All of them determine nuclear localization of YAP. So it seems that there is a converging pathway for all the microRNAs that you have selected that converges on YAP activation. And not only this is a pathway for proliferation, but it is also essential for proliferation because if you give the microRNA here in black, you see proliferation. But if simultaneously given a siRNA that knocks down YAP, basically you blunt completely proliferation. This is in, in white here. So you need the YAP to have proliferation induced by the microRNAs. And what was interesting was the mechanism by which they activate YAP. And here the mechanism might be different. For example, the embryonic mRNAs, microRNAs, 302D and 373, uh, uh, are known to inactivate LATS, which is the upstream kinase of YAP, so the, the one that phosphorylates YAPs and keeps this in the cytoplasm. Uh, microRNA1 in 99 downregulated this kinase here, which is called tau K1, and this protein here, which is called beta-TRCP. And uh, uh, both of these are direct targets of the microRNA. So if you give the microRNA and uh, you have a construct in which there is a 3' UTR for these two genes, upstream luciferate gene, you downregulate this, so this is a, a proof of direct targeting. And tau K1 is a further kinase upstream of MST1, so it's an inhibitory kinase, so it's very, very meaningful that this microRNA downregulates this to activate TAP. And beta-TRCP is the E3 ubiquitin ligase, that uh, uh, triggers a degradation of phosphorylated YAP. And again, it makes a lot of sense. The microRNA works by downregulating these uh, uh, two genes. And indeed, if you d just take a siRNAs against the tau K1 on beta TRCP, you increase the cardiomyocyte proliferation. This is E2 incorporation, and you activate uh, YAP. So everything fits with the mechanism. Something uh, unexpected was uh, uh, this. Uh, a lane here, in which there was a strong involvement of several genes involved in the actin cytoskeleton. If you see here, there are myomazines, uh, uh, and, and this gene here, uh, which is a cofilin 2, which is uh, downregulated uh, in the presence of several of the, of the micro of the microRNAs. And indeed, if you take the uh, uh, if you take the three prime UTR or cofilin 2, and you test the effect on the three prime UTR of the microRNA, you see that at least four of the proproliferative microRNAs, including 199A, downregulate cofilin 2 and cofilin 2 is also downregulated the level of mRNA and the level of Western blotting of the protein. What is cofilin 2 It is a, a major factor that promotes actin depolymerization. So in uh, the presence of uh, inhibition of cofilin 2 more actin is polymerized. And in the cancer field, it's known that uh, having polymerized actin it is needed to have a cell proliferation. So if you keep acting in a non-polymerized way, the cell doesn't have the capacity to uh, 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 proliferate. Uh, uh, there was involvement uh, in addition to active cytoskeleton also of the sarcomere, which made us very curious. So we were very surprised that, uh, uh, indeed we were very surprised at the beginning, but if you think, well, a cardiomyocyte have a very structured sarcomere and contractile apparatus and cytoskeleton, so it makes a lot of sense that these need to be downregulated. All the green here are downregulated before the proliferation can occur. So we took 500 siRNAs against all known components 
of the actin cytoskeleton and the sarcomere, and one by one we tested the effect of each individual sRNA on cardiomyocyte proliferation. We found that a, a reasonable series of sRNAs uh, 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 induce proliferation of neonatal cardiomyocyte. Cofilin 2 is here, just to give you an idea. This is the extent of proliferation compared to the two most effective microRNAs, 198, 3P, 190. So if you uh, uh, knock down this gene here, you have an effect that is equal to the effect of this uh, microRNA, for example. Where are these genes? Well, they belong to the different structures in the cell. Uh, uh, these two genes, syncoiling and syntrophin, so the top one, uh, uh, belong to the DCZ complex, so the complex that uh, anchors dystrophin to laminin in the uh, extracellular portion of the cells. Then there is a tropomyosin, uh, emboplastin, and uh, uh, nebulet and cofilin 2, which are essential instead to anchor the sarcomere to the uh, actin cytoskeleton through the zeta disc. So it seems that every time you touch the components, the structural components of the cells uh, in terms of uh, uh, sarcomeres or contractile apparatus or cytoskeleton and anchoring the cytoskeleton to the extracellular matrix, you trigger cell proliferation, which in my mind means that the default for these cells is to proliferate until it is blocked by this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, anchoring. And indeed, if you knock down uh, uh, cofilin 2, you see not only proliferation of cells through EDU incorporation, we also see TIAD promoter activity. So there is a, a strong final effector of this pathway through YAP uh, activation. You can measure also the uh, efficacy of actin polymerization, uh, polymerization through a biochemical, biochemical assay in which you measure the ratio between uh, globular actin and filamentous uh, uh, actin. You see, normally there are about 50% of these in the cells. This is a positive control, so uh, you, you trigger more filamentous actin. You give microRNA 199-3P uh, or cofilin 2, you uh, shift the balance toward filamentous actin. You can see this uh, also microscopically. You see this is a normal cardiomyocytes treated with a microRNA control. You see these bundles of the sarcomeres where uh, alpha actinin and uh, actin, uh, stained by phalloidin, uh, costain, if you give microRNA 199, this completely shifts to a very round uh, structure in which there are formation of these circular bundles of actin, which is called uh, normally in the cancer field, on the cell biology field, is cortical actin, several rounds of cortical actin around. This is the embryonic stem cell microRNA. You see also this kind of picture. This is 590 instead. This is proliferative, but doesn't change much of the picture compared to here. So it must have a completely different uh, mechanism. This is a normal cardiomyocyte with an sRNA control. This is an sRNA against cofilin 2, again, this round shape with this uh, cortical actin in several rounds. We also can appreciate here a down regulation of uh, actin because you start disassembling the contractile uh, apparatus. This is as far as the mechanism is concerned. Obviously, a, a big question is, uh, are these microRNA effective for therapeutic uh, purposes? Regenerating the heart of the mouse is relatively simple. Regenerating the heart of a human would require production of billions of cardiomyces. So let's test in a big animals. So we went to pigs, and these are uh, farm pigs, in which we occluded the uh, left descent anterior uh, artery, a branch that uh, causes uh, um, an infarction, reproducible infarction of the septum and the anterior wall. We use the navy vector expressive 199 because it is very conserved among all species, perfect uh, sequence conservation. We did a lot of work to test which is the best uh, uh, AV vector serotype. We end up finding that AV9 doesn't work well in our hands in pig hearts. We have to turn to AV6. AV6 is not very diffusible, so the experiment were performed by injecting after 90 minutes of reperfusion, 20 injection all around the uh, border zone in the left uh, uh, ventricle. The results were truly spectacular. This is uh, uh, the pigs followed by uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, so very objective uh, parameter. Here you can see ejection fraction uh, in the control animal. It progressively goes uh, down in white. In the animal treated with the AV199A, it progressively goes up. Uh, in first side, it's actually the opposite. It goes down. They are equal at uh, two days in both uh, uh, situations. Whereas it goes down and in first size, it goes up in the control, it goes down in the animals uh, treated. If you look by histology, there are a large number of KI67 positive cells. 
in the infarct uh, uh, border zone of the animals treated. And uh, most of these cells are also positive for GATA4, which is a marker of reactivation of a sort of uh, developmental program. You see the infrared border zone, there are different magnification of these uh, very nice uh, cells. We nickname these cells in the laboratory Mirnoblasts, so we, don't, we really don't know what they are. They are the pathology set tells us that they don't exist in normal, in normal uh, development. And this is how they look at the uh, MRI. Uh, the, uh, well, let me show this here. This is a control pig. So the MRI uh, infarcted zones, the control same by the software in red. You see big infarct in the septum in the left uh, uh, ventricle anterior wall. And basically this is the same animal, six sections from the apex to the base of the heart. Uh, first week up to two months. And you see basically that this big infarct is transformed progressively in a scar uh, which stays there at uh, um, eight weeks. If you give uh, instead uh, microRNA 199A, you see that the, s the size of the infant is more or less, uh, look at these two sections, the same in the animals, but it progressively disappears. It really seems to disappear, so there is this infant that uh, four weeks is no uh, longer uh, there. Let's keep this for the sake of time. This is a, a, a regional wall thickening uh, through gated uh, uh, MRI. But I want to show you these movies. This is a movie of a, a control animal. Uh, at one month after myocardial infarction, you see this uh, big left uh, ventricle thinning of the uh, septum, alkinesia, the dilatation. And these are two animals that were injected instead with 199A. You see that uh, uh, there is a preservation of the contractile mass. The ventricle remains smaller. And also the kinetics of contraction is much more uh, uniform. Do we have solved the problem? Probably not. Uh, uh, we don't know what might happen a very long times because this is very nice but, uh, in the short term because AV vectors express this pro-regenerative microRNAs basically forever but if you still look at the two months you see that the heart is really infiltrated by these uh, KI67 positive cells, GATA positive uh, cells. There are very, very many. A few uh, these cells are also positive for myogenin which is uh, a marker of uh, undifferentiated cells in the skeletal muscle uh, during development. So is this good for the heart? Most likely not. A few animals died because of arrhythmias uh, after two months of observation. This is the death of one of these animals. You see ventricular tachyxtrasystole uh, falling in a repolarization period and then and uh, to sudden one and then these animals undergoes ventricular arrhythmia and then eventually dies. Then there is another problem that we underestimated, that we are delivering an AV vector expressing the gene of the microRNA, but uh, uh, the microRNA uh, is formed is in the form of the precursor, and it is uh, uh, then DICER who chooses, uh, uh, sorry, RISC who chooses, which are the two pass the strands, either the guide or the passenger thread, which are incorporated. And if you measure if it is the upper strand or the lower strand of the microRNA that are incorporated in pigs, it is mostly the uh, upper strand. But we selected for proliferation the 199 3P. Instead, we see that in the heart of pigs, there is two-thirds of the microRNA that are produced are the 199A 5P, which has an uh, unwanted effect. Uh, certainly, it is not. Uh, proliferative and so then there is always the issue of what this microRNA can do in other organs. So this is the reason why we don't want to go with AV vectors if we cannot uh, into a large animals and we want to turn to synthetic microRNAs. Now there is a, a, a sort of a dogma in the field that if we inject a synthetic microRNA this is rapidly degraded. It's absolutely not true. If you take a standard Darmacon synthetic RNA, Darmacon because this is what we use, any synthetic microRNA, you inject this in the heart directly, this is a mouse experiment. It, uh, after two days, it is uh, more than 200 times than the endogenous level. Then it goes down progressively, but uh, at 12 days, it's still there, and it is there in an active form because we can see down regulation of some direct targets, uh, genes, uh, even at two days. And, uh, 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 and one single injection is uh, sufficient to drive significant cardiac repair. This is a, these are big scars in the left ventricles in control animals. These are much smaller scars in animals that had received just a single injection of 199A in the form of a synthetic microRNA um, uh, coupled with a lipofectamine-based uh, delivery uh, reagent. So very significant uh, um, uh, improvement in injection fraction, a very significant decrease in uh, infarct size. 
And I want to you leave you with this, uh, uh, these pictures that uh, I think are uh, somehow suggestive that really therapy with a synthetic microRNA for myocardial regeneration could be feasible. You see that uh, this is uh, uh, 12 days after myocardial infarction and injection of uh, 590 mimic uh, bromosus uridine staining. You see a lot of small cardiomyocytes that uh, have incorporated BRDU. They are smaller and more lighter because probably they are a bit more detached from the, from the plane of the section uh, uh, that are positive. The nucleus positive for BRDU, you see that these uh, small microRNA that uh, respond on this. You also see some, some uh, what might be suggestive of cortical actin, you see here. That might be very interesting uh, in terms of uh, therapeutic uh, perspective. This was taken up also as uh, editor speaking, circulation research, uh, um, this, uh, the last issue. So I believe, I don't know if we will be able to, to, to transform this into a real therapy. You understand that the difference with one billion embryonic stem cells converted to one billion cardiomyocytes, this would allow having just a via with a microRNA with a delivery reagent that any interventional cardiologist could inject in the heart, supposedly that this works also through coronary injection. So a completely different kind of medicine. I don't know if we will be able to do to do so, we will do our best, but certainly I think that dogmatically uh, this idea that um, regeneration of the heart could be induced by a stimulated endogenous reparative potential is uh, interesting and could, uh, to my, my opinion could also be applied to our other organs uh, like the sensory nervous system and other organs that uh, don't uh, uh, regenerate spontaneously. A lot of people who have contributed to this work, you've seen the names uh, and the pictures uh, uh, during the talk, uh, so I won't name anybody from my laboratory, just uh, to tell that uh, this is a, a long-standing collaboration for the big animal part with Fabio Reca, IKEA part at the Temple University and part uh, the Institute of Physiology Clinica in the, uh, Pisa. And uh, all the histology is uh, from pigs, is from Rossana Bussani from the University Hospital in Trieste. And I thank you very, very much for your attention. presentation so do we have questions yes I have two one is when you have the, when you have the hyperplasia uh, of the the heart uh, when you so what happens to the capillary cardiac monocyte ratio is it still maintained that's one question yeah second question is when you have a MI and the monocytes seem to recover what happens to the vascularity do they do they recruit the vasc I mean how does they they still need nutrients so I was wondering yeah. what happens to the vascularity. Yeah, if, if you measure the, the cardiomassa capillary ratio, uh, it is absolutely normal. So um, in my impression, I've been working uh, for, with an AVVGF uh, uh, in the heart for 14 years, and my, the impression I have is that uh, capillaries uh, are never the cause uh, of cardiac dysfunction in the heart, but uh, they tend to follow the, the um, behavior of cardiomyocytes. So if you have proliferation, as you have during development, you also have increased formation of capillaries that follows. Certainly they are normal in this condition. I have a, um, do you have a, I have a question? Do you have a sense on what is the time frame of the intervention to, to let's say, to achieve regeneration? Do you have a, a time window or a... No, that, that? that's a very good point. The, uh, the most reasonable assumption is that is having a patient who is brought to the uh, cath lab, uh, he uh, performs PCI, and then after three or four or five days, uh, inflammation uh, is transfer starts transforming into fibrosis and, and, uh, and healing through fibrosis. And at that time point, uh, through the same catheter, you give a bolus of these microRNAs and you trigger a regeneration. Cardiologists tell me that uh, not necessarily this is uh, uh, what's most interesting because the most interesting thing would be to wait six months and see when patients after myocardial infarction tend to develop bad or, and, and have uh, the microRNA working at that point when there is a scar. And we don't know absolutely if this microRNA could work when there is, a, there is a scar. There are genetic models now that show that a scar can be reabsorbed if there is proliferation in the mouse, in transgenics, and we're trying now to inject after a scar. A question about um, the serotypes you used with AV delivered microRNA. So you looked at six and nine, is that correct? Yeah, we, used nine for, we used nine in vivo for mice, 
and seeks for all the in vitro experiments uh, from all species, including humans, in cardiomyocyte in vitro. And in pigs, for some reason, six works in our hands better than nine in vivo. Um, do you, what, what exactly was it about six that, that worked better? It just transduced I, I truly don't know. I mean, I'm always lost when, uh, when I try to rationalize about <laughs> AV serotypes. <laughs> Probably not something that has to relate uh, it can be related to uh, extracellular receptor bus about to, to pathways that follow after internalization. But that was done all uh, intramuscularly. The, all this was intramuscular, okay. yes. I mean, intra, intra, intra cardiac, yes. Cardiac. In the cardiac muscle. Is there any other question? If not, I would like to thank you again thank for you. the wonderful presentation and thank you all.